Hello and uh, welcome to all the attendees to our first talk of our new series called uh, Book Conversations, which aims to highlight new books by African and Africanist authors in the fields of humanities, arts, and social sciences. Our first session covers a new book by uh, Jelaine Tawadros titled The Sphinx Contemplating Napoleon. She will be joined by Dr. Sarat Maharaj and the discussion will be moderated by Dr. Salah Hassan, director of the Africa Institute. Uh, this session will be uh, an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the Q&A and uh, attendance. Uh, the session is also going to be made available on our YouTube channel in the future, incorporating Arabic subtitles for uh, Arabic speaking audiences. Uh, I would also like to let you know that you have, if you are in the UAE, we would like to inform you that there are 10 author signed copies of the book uh, available for sale through the Africa Institute. If you're interested for uh, if you're interested, please feel free to contact us through the info at the Africa um, for details on how to uh, purchase them. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this discussion and I will now pass it on to Dr. Salah. Well, thank you so much, Satan. Thank you, Jelaine. Thank you, uh, Sarat. Uh, so welcome everyone to the first, uh, as Satan mentioned, of the Africa Institute series of webinars featuring new books uh, on African and African diaspora studies. Of course, we are hopeful that uh, at some point, these webinars will become in-person events once this pandemic fades away or let us, let us hope vanishes. Uh, today, uh, we are featuring the London-based Egyptian British scholar and, his, and his art historian, Jelaine Tawadros' uh, uh, new book. Uh, the Sphinx Contemplating Napoleon, Global Perspective on Contemporary Art and Difference, published by uh, Bloomsbury. Um, before we start, I must say it's a pleasure and honor to introduce to you uh, the author, uh, Jelaine Tawadros, and uh, scholar, critic, and curator, uh, Sarad Maharaj. Uh, the two are among the most influential intellectuals, art historians, art critic, curators, and public intellectuals of our time, and most specifically in the field of global, uh, modern, and contemporary art and culture. Uh, when I recall or I think about the British scene, uh, even just the contemporary art scene globally, uh, two entities come to mind. And at least for me and for many people in my generation, they have been very formative. INIVA, or Institute of International Visual Arts uh, in London, and of course, CERTEX, as two important institutions that have been very, very influential uh, in basically shifting the terrain in British art, but also in the global art scene. And many scholars, as I mentioned, of my generation found them to be important resources when we think and contemplate about all our field and when I entered personally the field of art history in the late 80s and early uh, 90s. And there are two, the two, uh, Jelaine was associated with Innova as a founding director and Sarat as an intellectual uh, and, and, and a public figure in the art as a critic, as a writer, as a curator have been very important in shaping that terrain among, of course, along with other uh, people of, 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 uh, who were in London at the time, uh, people like Rashid Arain, people like Eddie Chambers, and many artists, John Confra, among many that now you see active in the scene. And those people taught us lessons, shift to the terrain, make us really think differently about the art. If I may say just uh, a few words just about the book, which is uh, which, as it reads in the synopsis, uh, it's a, a, a key figure in the, uh, a key figure in British and international art, Jelaine Tawadros draws the dif difference to the, uh, uh, the surface, recuperating it as a potentially radical frame through which to understand contemporary art and everyday world. Playing with forms of writing from critical an uh, analysis to fictional narratives, the book function as a, uh, a practice-based meditation on how to write about contemporary art. Of course, this is, has to do with the long history of um, Jelaine work, who is, which uh, basically uh, moves between theoretical engagement, but also 
anchored in artistic uh, practice. So the vibrant collection of essays that brought together here spanned a long period of time between 1992 and, and, and 2017. And I'm glad, uh, Jelaine, that you brought them together for us and make them available for younger scholars and for generations to come. Briefly, I think we, we have on our website and, and the advertisement for this uh, webinar, uh, uh, bios of, of, of the two, uh, Jelaine and, and Sarat. But I will just say a few words that Jelaine is a writer, a curator, and a chief executive at DAX currently. Uh, she was the founding director of INEVA, as I mentioned, and uh, which was chaired by the late professor Stuart Hall which over a decade achieved international reputation as a groundbreaking cultural agency at the leading edge of artistic practice and cultural debate nationally and internationally. Uh, she served currently as a trustee and vice chair of the Stuart Hall Foundation, among many other editorial boards and uh, uh, boards of trustee. Um, Sarat uh, was born in South Africa, educated uh, in England, uh, and but he's, he's a writer, a curator, and an art historian, as I mentioned. Uh, he was uh, known for co-curating Document 11 and has uh, recently co uh, curated uh, retinal, optical, visual, conceptual at uh, Museum Boymans uh, in Rotterdam. Uh, sorry, it was in 2002, and Richard Hamilton and Eke Bonk, and among many other uh, works, including Biennials, uh, and uh, uh, Gothenburg, uh, uh, among many other ones. Um, he's also, uh, he was a, a professor of history and theory at Goldsmiths, University of London, and, and, and also was the first Rudolf Arnheim professor at Hamburg University between 2001 and two, and a research fellow at, at, at the Van Eck Academy uh, in Maastricht. So let me begin. Uh, of course, this would be a dialogue between uh, Jelaine and uh, and uh, Sarat, and uh, my role is is of moderating. But I would love to start uh, just by asking Jelaine uh, specifically to say a few words uh, uh, about the book. Uh, I love the anecdote behind the title uh, of the Sphinx uh, talking back. <laughs> Uh, to Napoleon, uh, but I also love the anecdote behind the uh, uh, Jerome's painting, Bonaparte, uh, or Bonaparte before the Sphinx, 18, from 1867, 1868. Uh, so Jelaine, if you can say a few words about the book, that would be great. Thank you so much, Salah. Um, and thank you to the Africa Institute very much for hosting uh, this event and to Bloomsbury. Um, so just about the title, perhaps, um, as you said, this comes from a painting by the 19th century French Orientalist painter jean léon Jérôme. He did a whole load of paintings of Napoleon Bonaparte in Egypt to mark uh, Napoleon's invasion and occupation of Egypt in the late 18th century. But his favourite painting, the one he wouldn't sell and kept for himself and his family, was one of Napoleon sitting astride a horse and facing the Sphinx. And Bonaparte's actually very tiny in this painting and the Sphinx is colossal, <laughs> monumental. And yet you collect the impression that, uh, you know, it's Napoleon who's the victor um, and the unchallenged sort of uh, authority. So I was always rather taken with this painting, which currently is at Hearst Hotel and, it's been called Bonaparte Before the Sphinx. It's also been called Bonaparte Contemplating the Sphinx. So I thought I, the book would imagine a different scenario. Um, and it does this by bringing together a series of essays and writings, which really propose different perspectives on that still continue actually to dominate art and art history. And the book draws unapologetically on my own formation in the shadow of the colonial and post-colonial, what Stuart Hall described memorably, memorably in his memoir as hinged between the two. Um, and this sort of double consciousness or double vision is 
I suppose, a way of seeing the world from here and there simultaneously. And it's one shared with many artists and intellectuals and writers who I respect and admire, who have in different ways interrupted and reorientated cultural discourse in, North, in Europe and North America by drawing ideas, experiences and approaches which are unfamiliar to the so-called mainstream. So the book is made up of essays, texts, writings, um, which, as you said, Salah, um, were written over a period of about 25 years, often in response to invitations to curate or write or talk or all three. Um, and I wanted to retrace my steps over that quarter century and try and make sense of the journey and understand what questions preoccupied me and that these texts collectively ask. And I guess one of the questions is, how do you write about contemporary art and difference? Um, especially as art, as Sarat has very, very eloquently written, is such a slippery thing. You know, it resists language. It, it almost makes language unnecessary. And the, the temptation is always to try and hold it, capture it, pin it down. Um, and yet, you know, art is a form of knowledge, it's productive of knowledge and ideas. And to try and pin it down with language actually is to constrain it in some ways. So um, that's one question, I guess. The other was a, a realization just how important artists have been to me in my formation. Um, so many of the artists that I talk about in the book, uh, Adel Abdus Samid, Sonia Boyce, Shita the Biswa, Serena Bimji, Clifford Charles, Jimmy Durham, Mona Hatoum, Susan Hiller, Alfredo Jarre, many, many, Zinab Sadira, Keith Piper, Joe Stockham, so many, um, are ones with whom I've had long-standing relationships. And in many respects, artistic practice, perhaps more than academic discourse and art criticism, has provided me, you know, with critical tools and an intellectual framework for writing about art. And this is something who, you know, people I owe a huge debt to, including the two on this <laughs> call here, um, you know, also um, share. And I suppose that's the other thing to say, that this has been a journey with thinkers and curators and intellectuals. Um, I've been privileged to know and work closely with a number of those who I respect deeply and who've greatly influenced me. As I said, Salah and Sarat being key among them, but also Stuart Hall, Jean Fisher, Gavin Yantiers, Guy Brett, Elle Hooks, others who I didn't have a chance to meet like Edward Said and poets and writers like James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, Derek Walcott, Audrey Lord, and many, many others. Well, thank you so much. I mean, at this juncture, because I really wanted Saraj to uh, uh, kind of uh, enter into this dialogue. So uh, I don't know if you want to start by any observations, remarks on the book itself, uh, Saraj, and what it meant to you and, uh, and to the art scene in Britain and globally at this moment. Yes. Well, thank you, Salah. And thank you, Jelaine, for that rather lovely introduction to your whole project. Um, I suppose um, it evoked in me the, the thought, when did I first get to know Jelaine? And since this is such a personal achievement, I just wanted to make a remark about that. The contact with Jelaine, I feel I stumbled over your essay um, on, on the Sphinx contemplating Napoleon. Uh, in third text, and that might be where I came across your name, and we subsequently spoke on the phone. I don't know how, uh, because I wouldn't have had your telephone number. <laughs> and uh, then we met in Southampton in that rather crucial conference on 
the difference between difference and critical difference, as it were, which was a bit of a mouthful, but that was a sort of struggle at the time. And over the years, what's baffled me and puzzled me again and again uh, was, well, what on earth was the Sphinx contemplating with regard to Napoleon? Uh, and I've, I've often wished I had really got around to asking Ghislaine, what did she think the Sphinx had in mind? I felt the Sphinx said, oh dear, rather wearily, not another Johnny come lately in a sharp suit. Is this what I have to put up with? I've seen it time and time again. And now there comes another conqueror who thinks he's in charge, but we've seen it all before. And this rather stuck in my mind because I think it, it has the, the elements that make up the perspective of this work, which as you say, are multiple, the perspectives are multiple. And those are given to us by the fact that Napoleon was contemplating the Sphinx, but it, indeed you have carried out a kind of inversion. And it's that reversal of the gaze that I suppose occupied a great deal of the art scene and critical scene, the scene over migrations, the presence of people from elsewhere in, in the continent of Europe. And we've often called that um, the reversal of the gaze. The Sphinx is looking back in a way that was to legitimate looking back as opposed to looking at one's feet, looking away, looking, avoiding the gaze of the colonial master. This was really the attempt to reaffirm the gaze of looking back. It of course echoed with later formulations of the empire strikes back. These were, were elements uh, that we, we begin to see. The more sustained development around how the colonial gaze was to be returned. I myself dealt with it as Arachne returning the gaze of Athena, that the, the black Athena played a big role here and the, the um, African origins of Greek civilization, Bernal's very important work was, was something that one couldn't not think about. But you speak of double consciousness, double vision, which of course takes us to Dubois, where the, the idea really stems from, this, this doubleness, and of course was developed in Paul Gilroy's thinking around the Black Atlantic. But while these were theoretical um, positions, I think your big achievement was to evoke it with something so concrete and something so personal, something so connected with the place from which you came to Egypt, its history, and, and of course you quote that very poignant uh, image that Stuart used to describe those who were in such a situation in the hinge of the colonial and post-colonial, coming from that swinging moment between being in Europe and being at the edge of Europe or outside Europe and in a totally different continent. So I'm sorry to go on so long, but what I wanted was, because you start with this lovely anecdote from Jerome, and because there was such a history of artworks around Napoleon from David, uh, uh, David's painting of 18, 1801 of uh, Napoleon, crossing the Alps, as it were, that particular work, and then followed by Jericho's uh, work from around 1812 of the Charging Chasseur, and then we come to 
that after the Medusa and so on. And in the 1840s, we're at Delaroche's rather realistic works of Napoleon amongst the poor and the, the lep leper stricken. And then we come to Jerome who tussles with the image of Napoleon. So it is as though something had been conquered and something was on the verge of being lost because all along there is a tussle with Britain and France over the possession of, um, of Egypt. We know that on the English side, there are a large number of satires by Gilray and so on uh, around Napoleon and around the, the Egyptian expedition and so on. Once all these scholars and artists uh, join the, the, the flotilla of ships that go to Egypt on the, on the expedition, that's the other amazing part. So there is a very, very rich kind of uh, body of um, art historical material around this expedition into Italy. They go to crack the code of the Sphinx and the riddle of the Sphinx, but they also return riddled by the Sphinx. And it seemed to me that that riddling of Napoleon's expedition is what haunts the whole project. And uh, so I just want to come back, Jelaine, to say, did you ever think anecdotally what the this, what this Sphinx might have been thinking in more colloquial terms? I know that your whole project of <laughs> double consciousness tells us what on a theoretical level the Sphinx was thinking, but did you have a sentence that somehow sums it up? I'm asking you because of your feeling for language that you might have a a, a bit of a sentence to sum up the Sphinx's exasperation, yet another conqueror. I don't know I have, Sarah, but um, it always struck me that despite the fact that Napoleon's army's cannon, you know, blew off the Sphinx's nose, that somehow there's still a majesty and resilience and endurance uh, as well as exasperation on the part of the Sphinx. Um, but I don't have a one-liner for you. I'll have to think about that one. <laughs> well, but well, when I think about it, I think your, your whole life and your whole contribution is actually part of that contemplation, part of that way of trying to, to contemplate what the Sphinx saw, but in, of course, in the present uh, sense. So um, what I actually wanted to say to both of you is that, because I think both of you entered the scene probably around the same time, what, what did it look like? Because, because the, the British scene is interesting that at that time you have the, uh, the Black British movement, which came after the, 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 the American one uh, on this side of the Atlantic. Um, but then the British scene was almost in a form of an apartheid. What, what is it like to enter into this? You have on one side the British white establishment, uh, but then on the other side there is the Black British. And, and you enter into that and you have been, of course, struggling, uh, trying to fight, trying to expand the narrative and so on. So it, I wanted from the two of you to give a sense of, of, of that, of living through that period and, and managing to articulate or to create the, the, the very raw material, the very discourse that we are all benefiting from right now. Well, if I can say something, I mean, you know, um, Innova emerged through the efforts of very many artists principally who were, and Gavin Yantes uh, uh, leading them together with Eddie Chambers you mentioned and Sunil Gupta, Rashid Arayin, Lubaina Himid, Claudette Johnson, uh, Marlene Smith, a number of artists who um, saw in the landscape, as it were, of, of British art and British art cultural institutions, that despite the fact that there was so much extraordinary 
work being produced that institutions did not exhibit or show that work. And in terms of writing, there was hardly any space for a critical discourse either around that work. So, you know, when I did my master's degree on black British women artists, Sonia Boyce, Lubaina Himmed and Shita Babizwas, there were no texts, there was nothing. There were maybe a handful of um, reviews of small exhibitions which might have mentioned those artists but apart from that there was nothing so you know there, there were no texts to refer to you had to there was no option but to create the text and in a sense to create the discourse and through Gavin's efforts and the Arts Council you know to create the institutions uh, like Inifo, but also autograph and third text, which were really important um, vehicles, both to exhibit work and to discuss the work. But there was also, you know, a sense of excitement, I think, as well, about uh, ideas and images and artworks that were like nothing else being produced. So, you know, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that there was a sense, looking back, I, I imagine like that was like the Harlem Renaissance, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, such a, such a rich productivity of ideas and artworks um, and energy to give them space and demand space for them, whether that be critical, discursive space or white cube space of the gallery or museum. I'm glad that you mentioned those several names and I'm, I'm so glad that they are in attendance, by the way, including Gavin. Oh, great. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so happy he's here and, and look forward to his reflections. But Sarat, uh, if you can reflect uh, on the same era or series of questions that I ask. Yes, uh, thank you. I think it was a rather odd situation. I think um, Rashid uh, played an important role in articulating uh, one concept which uh, has struck me as being crucial. Of course, all the artists that Jelaine has just mentioned, I shan't go over those names again, were struggling to be seen as artists, artists today who had a creativity that had to be acknowledged. They were of the present, they were here, and they were saying things about the modern contemporary world. They weren't vehicles of cultures they had left behind, ancient, noble, uh, wonderful cultures. These might be illusions and references and strands of thinking that they would evoke or brush aside, but ultimately they had to be taken seriously as practitioners here working in Britain and as part of the realities we faced here. This was an argument that Rashid tussled with again and again, the refusal to uh, ethnicize and, and as it were reduce the artist to an agent of the ethnographic department and the fact that as soon as you had an artist from elsewhere, the consideration was that they were doing something that had to do with Africa or Asia or the Caribbean, and that this work was more properly to be shown or seen in the ethnographic collections or in the museums and not in the galleries and not seen as contemporary creativity. This was a tremendous struggle because on, on, this, on the uh, level of contemporary presence of being part of the now of Britain, of being a creator here and not a vehicle of an ancient culture that you were representing, that being yourself, the autonomy of your creativity, this, this was something that had to be thrashed out in a place like London, it was both difficult for England at the time, I suppose, 
to understand this or accept this because anybody who did anything that looked vaguely contemporary was seen as a copycat modernist, that they were doing something derivative that they could not surely be part of a European or Western modernistic uh, idiom. They were in some ways uh, second hand and they were coming to it without the kind of long historical experience and belonging to Europe or to the West that would produce that notion of being part of the avant-garde or part of a practice that could be seen as contemporary. So there was that tremendous battle against ethnographization, if one might put it in, in this barbaric uh, word, uh, that, that had to be fought against. I think Gavin Janchis was uh, placed in a very, very pointed way to, to address some of this too. And his insight and his kind of wisdom was a tremendous shaping force over this period. And that was largely because he had himself grown up in South Africa in the apartheid regime, which on the one hand in the art schools let one completely brush up against all the avant-garde modernist languages and expressions that were current, but on the other hand, expected one to be a non-white artist, referencing and alluding to uh, traditions and cultures of the past, that one was in somehow a vehicle for this ancient archaic essential identity that was received from one's traditional background. And Gavin Janchis had been through that and then been through it again in Germany, in his, his education there. So he was highly experienced and highly knowledgeable about the intricacies of this that, that uh, Rashid was expressing. And so I would think that they chipped away, hammered away at the idea that somehow you segregate the artists who have come to England recently as immigrants or of immigrant background, and you, you treated them in, in a separate category altogether. This, uh, they could never be treated seriously as contemporary artists. That was the struggle to begin with. So we call it the struggle for visibility in contemporary art, but the issues behind it are very powerfully linked with the assumptions that if you come from somewhere else, you can only be a representative of that tribal background. Maybe later on, this undergoes some sort of change. Today, we are less uh, prickly about that kind of uh, assumption because there are other issues on the table that have to be discussed, that there are other ways of knowing other cultural experiences which are equally interesting and valid when we think of global society. But I think that was the break that had to be made. So those of us who grew in an apartheid society, like myself and Gavin Janchis, we were confronted with what seemed to us rather backward attitudes here, because those debates had already begun in the South African art academies and schools. Uh, for non-whites, these were segregated academies. And then of course, we, we linked with the thinking that artists here brought the list of artists that Jelaine has mentioned, and often uh, with Gavin and Rashid playing quite a leading role in all of this. Uh, that's my sort of picture of the 70s into the 80s. When I arrived as a young lecturer, at Goldsmiths College, the first batch of non-white students arrived at Goldsmiths College. Really, for the first time, there were more black faces than we'd ever had at Goldsmiths College, which had always built itself as a college centered in the heart of uh, an immigrant area of London, South London, 
But when you looked at the faces of students in the college, there were hardly uh, any uh, students from Black or Asian or Caribbean background. So that was a moment, I think, of change that one began to see. How come so many Black students of that period were accepted into the art school? What change was that beginning to signal? I'm thinking of 1982 or 1983, and I'm thinking of artists like um, Zarina Bimji, Shanaz Hanslot, I'm thinking of, um, well, even Mark Seeley, and I'm, uh, I think uh, Virginia Namako a little later. I can go on listing these names, Jennifer Comrie, Linda Gorman, Terry Dyer, Kenneth Williams, all of these suddenly together at Goldsmiths College, what would such a black presence amount to? How would it shake up this idea that here are people studying to be contemporary artists, developing a practice, and yet the larger culture and institutions deny that sort of contemporary creativity to people of color? You know, I, Jelaine, I, I didn't want to take away the, sh you know, I mean, although all of these things are very related to your uh, book, of course, but I wanted to get back to the book. And I'm also, uh, uh, I mentioned this to both of you, especially Sarat, uh, you are also free to enter into a dialogue amongst yourself and, uh, and uh, I'm just my role as a moderator. But there's one thing that I thought, just going back to the book, I, I, the, chap, the part two, which is really interesting to me because it, it's very relevant to the discussion now, which is the banality of difference. Of course, we know the banality of evil as we experience it on, on, on a daily basis uh, or now. Uh, but the, but it, it's interesting because your talk is really about how to think about difference and, and especially the, the, the conference you cited in Southampton and I hope you reflect on it vis-a-vis uh, -vis this. But I wanted to ask you, Jelaine, there are two, uh, uh, I, I, I love the contemplation on the crime scene, the chapter on uh, the crime scene, because it brings in this kind of issue of difference. So if you can highlight that chapter, uh, in addition to the, um, th there's a chapter on Van Lee, of course, uh, but I thought, Th that one on the crime scene is, 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 uh, is an interesting one that can highlight and tie to this discussion. Well, that, that um, essay uh, is, was a talk uh, for a conference in Duke University uh, that took place to mark a period when two other really important figures who we haven't mentioned, Sonia Boyce and David A. Bailey, who together as that took over, as it were, Eddie Chambers, African Asian Visual Artists Archive and developed that further and were really key protagonists as they continue to be um, within the British art world. Um, they had been studying, sort of pro visiting professors at Duke University and they convened a conference called Assembling the 80s, was, which was looking back at the 80s and precisely, you know, what Sarat has been describing. Um, the, the talk I gave was really trying to understand different currents within uh, that generation of artists and ones coming after them. Um, and some of the questions that emerge. So, you know, things like, I mean, Steve McQueen was one of those students at Goldsmiths. Um, but he also talked movingly about a fellow student who was constantly being persecuted by the police and harassed by the police when he was trying to uh, film, make film, you know, and the police basically just didn't believe that he could possibly be an artist. How could this young black man with a film camera be an artist? It was beyond their comprehension. And he subsequently committed suicide. But I think it's important to understand that that struggle that, that Sarat talked about was one which was existential in terms of the right to, to be 
a practicing artist and to be seen and accepted as a as a, a practicing artist it, it's also the other kind of other areas of complication that i touch on in the essay are for example how many of the white artists that were studying at goldsmiths like mark wallinger Gillian waring and others are obsessed with identity and yet black artists were always kind of interrogated around why identity was important and you know why you know really was their work only reducible to identity i think when um there was a infamous review of of uh, rashid arin's exhibition the other story which looked at uh artists from the post-war period to the present who came from afro-caribbean asian and Middle Eastern backgrounds. And he, um, you know, the reviewers were sort of setting up these, um, these contrasts, polarities between artists who were artists first and Indian second, as they described Anish Kapoor, and artists who uh, foregraded their identity and therefore were, could only secondarily be considered to be artists. Um, but what was interesting was how many artists at Goldsmiths, black and white, were, were tussling with questions of gender, class, and identity in all its forms, and sexuality. Um, and I suppose the other element of complication were that a, a generation coming after them, as on the hot on the heels of that 1980s generation, I think we're very wary of being defined purely by race or to be see, to be pigeonholed. And so their work would not be accepted, but therefore dismissed. So they kind of put an arm's length attitude to any kind of questions about race and identity and would avoid, evade, you know, any discussion of, of race. Um, Okay, sorry, I didn't know that you were actually done because you, okay. So Sarat, uh, if you have uh, uh, reflections on this, I was just taking a very important note to ask you later. Yeah. Sarat? Yeah. Yes, I think um, if, if perhaps we could shift the focus back towards the book, I, I'm of course uh, very deeply interested in the fact that <clears throat> throughout this work, which is a great lesson, I think, for contemporary writing on art, that the, the, the writing and the thinking not only takes place through an engagement with art practice, but with a language that is not social scientific. And it's a language that Jelaine where we can follow Jelaine's voice from word go to the to the very end and I think this is quite remarkable that there is no lapse and I can see how important this was also to Stuart Hall the idea that language in the social sciences had a kind of measure to them which was quite different from the usages of language in the discussion of um, uh, works of art. I'm, I'm struck then by translation. There are many levels on which we understand translation in this uh, second chapter, coming from the second chapter of your, your work, Jelaine. What struck me is not just simply the translation from, um, from one continent to another, migration and so on, but more essentially, the translation of the visual into the verbal, that this is this deep contradiction that we are tussling with in the world of art, that we have to, we, we have a highly sophisticated language in inverted commas. I don't like to describe the visual as language. Um, it's been my resistance to see it as a grammatical form, rather to see it as agrammatical, not as non-grammatical, non-grammatical, but specially made to be non-grammatical by the surrealists or uh, 
um, the abstract expressionists and so on. But this a -gramma grammaticality of the visual, we translate back into grammar of word-based language. And I just wondered what tussles you felt with that, that we have to translate the retinal, to use other language, the retinal into the conceptual and discursive, and that this produces its own disjunction in the kind of um, understanding of the works. It's very easy to become quite reductive about what a work is about when we use uh, language uh, of, of a verbal kind. I'm just trying to think in your work, I try to list out the uses of language. And I found that they were quite different uses that we put language to. For example, there are areas of description where you give a descriptive account. There are areas where you are disruptive with your language, maybe the very last sections on Padilla's work, which is scatological and excremental and explosive in a way that I find extremely interesting. And that disruption of syntax and grammar, something that thinkers have struggled with and have called a wordless syntax, that the visual is a wordless syntax. So we are called upon to put it into words. And what language is going to be adequate for that? A descriptive language, a disruptive language. The analytical discursive language is one which has grown in power from the 80s to, to this day. And maybe you, you would want to say something about the impact through Goldsmiths College of French theory, which in this period became the raw material through which new thinking was done. It wasn't that we set ourselves up to be masters and scholars of Deleuze or Derrida, as uh, Stuart always said, this was a catalytic material, that it was a, a medium through which one tried to think the unthinkable. And it, we had to go across the channel to the French thinkers to find the raw material for the language which we then knocked together for uh, the discussion of the conditions of contemporary production for people who were from elsewhere, to put it in this neutral way. So analytical, discursive, theoretical language. Then explanatory language. Is an artwork to be explained in the style of the explication du texte, that is that you give an explanation, an explication of the work of art. What are you doing? And lastly, is there another E word, an evocative language through which one plays with the work and creates a parallel reality to the works you are talking about, that it has nothing to do with unpacking the work, but everything to do with creating a work that runs parallel to the works under, under, under review or scrutiny. It seemed to me that there were all these different uses of language which we are tussling with, not least that we are in the age of art research and we are in an age where we are producing PhDs through visual arts, mm -hmm. but doing it also through verbal language. So these conditions of production seem to me to be uh, very, very important ones. And your use of language, your love of language, your, your facility with the language, your deep immersion in literature of, of several traditions, but um, whether we're reading something through Samuel Beckett, whether we're looking at a work by Sonia Boyce, but the material through which we enter it is a uh, business of waiting for Godot, or whether we're looking uh, 
at it through a reference to the insulting of Miss Bates on Box Hill in Emma by Jane Austen. There is a detailed touching back on literature and language as the raw material through which one might reflect on, on the visual. So I'm just wondering, Jelaine, what is the business of writing for you and writing about the visual? I know this is a hobby horse of mine, but uh, I know. Well, I guess it is because it is so difficult. It's so difficult. And in a sense, uh, every kind of form of art and every artwork has a different set of uh, demands. Um, you know, Edward Padilla's works are a series of mattresses which are stained. How to begin to address those, you know, to describe them would not be very, uh, would be insufficient as a way to talking about what those works are evoking and what they're touching on in terms of experience. Um, there's an essay which I wrote to coincide with the Brighton Photo Biennial, which took as its starting point um, a project between an artist, a photographer, um, Richard Avedon, and the writer James Baldwin. And there, James Baldwin, the, the, the two elements were produced totally separately from each other. Baldwin wrote a text and... Uh, Avedon travelled the country in the mid-60s taking photographs of everything and everyone from Allen Ginsberg through to, you know, the American Nazi Party, through to the last man born in slavery, through to the civil rights movement. And um, it struck me that, you know, James Baldwin's text, which is furious, absolutely, you know, overrunning with fury, at America and its self mythologization and its inability to accept the stranger, uh, the outsider. And Avedon's camera is cool, by contrast, cool, uh, you know, very, very controlled. And yet, even within that, he has these extraordinary images of a of a mental health, mental institution, mental hospital. And, you know, so there is an incommensurability between the images. And similarly with Baldwin, there are passages in his text, which are just like almost like a stream of consciousness. So I think it's about uh, tones that we are all, we all speak in different dialects, different tonalities, different registers, and artworks do too. And so it seems to me that writing about art has to also uh, explore and inhabit different tonalities and registers. Um, yes, I, I suppose, sorry. No, no, go ahead, sorry. sorry. I suppose, uh, Ghislaine, uh, my, uh, focus on language and the limits of language. Of course, it comes through again and again in your work, the idea of translation and opacity and the untranslatable, which um, um, Shen Wang uh, in her work uh, focused intensively across a long period. Many artists have touched on this in one way or the other. Sorry not to be able to mention them in detail and to treat them as in passing references. But the issue of language was also tied up with the search for the object of knowledge during the 80s and 90s. What exactly was the object of knowledge? We know it was contemporary creativity. We know it was people who had come from elsewhere or from a background in some other continent who are now here and part of uh, British reality. How was that to be expressed? Uh, Rashid Arin carried out a long 
uh, debate with the Arts Council for the institutional presence and uh, of, of uh, people of immigrant background somehow to be treated equally as other artists and have the access through the Arts Council to the resources that contemporary artists had in, in Britain, which unusually had amongst all the nationalizations of steel, coal, all the industries, it had also in a sense nationalized culture because the national culture was uh, presided over by a board that is the Arts Council of Great Britain as it used to be called at the, in, in those days. But the construction, the search and identification of what I call the epistemic object, what is the object of knowledge that has to be produced becomes more and more sharply defined. We look for a language in the 80s, we tussle with uh, the verbal and visual. Uh, there are roots through which the idea of creolite and pigeonization of language become interesting and important in questioning the standard language. But not just that, language to articulate what? To articulate diversity, difference, or critical difference. I think that becomes more and more the issue of, of the 90s and again has a deep and vital impact on things today. That by critical difference, we mean something quite different from diversity, which is to some extent stuck on the level of making room for someone different. Yeah an important idea and an important stage or step in the breakthrough of creating this new object of knowledge that first of all, you have to have visibility and that meant people have to be brought on board, included, we call it inclusivity in that dreadful way in which these things get bureaucratized. And critical difference, however, touched on the fact that you could never pin down difference, that we were all in a process of differentiation. And it was no, no good saying, yes, difference, diversity means our identities are fluid, but to be as static as a monument when we are actually dealing with identities. We, these are just boxes made up on the scene of representation. Uh, on the plane of representation, just spaces for quite fixed identities to be brought to the fore, to be brought to visibility. But creative difference was the harder issue to, to cope with and to articulate because it dealt with the temporality. It dealt with something that never gained fixity. And you either had a very Buddhistic or Derridean way of looking at this, in which you then were totally exasperated with verbal language, or there was a shift to performativity and perform, perform, performance art takes on great importance in this sense of giving the ephemeral, the transient, the passage through from A to B into something that is never going to be found. These qualities became more and more important as we move into the 90s and beyond. I'm just, um, I'm just really interested, I suppose, in um, looking at those early days of involvement in this search. I'm thinking of Zarina Binji, and I'm thinking of Ingrid Pollard, who's took us into the English landscape where there are very few black presences or non-white presences in the past. And she very dramatically uh, intervened in these spaces through photography, Zarina Binji through photography and through uh, her, her very important work for Documenta 11 eventually, uh, Out of Blue, 
where we find her using a kind of creolized phrase as the title of the work, not out of the blue, but out of blue, as would be said by an Indian mother, as it were, speaking in English, which is not her first language. And that is something Zarina adopts to suggest this difference, this passage from the standard into the pigeon, as it were. I'm, I'm just thinking again, uh, Jelaine, of whole list of people, think of uh, Northern Attitudes by Boyce, uh, Sarinda Dali was very, very interesting and hardly known work because she moved away from England to Canada, uh, but has now received much more affirmation in the art world in Canada, uh, who's pieced together with the most shaky material, film clips from the gas board, um, scenes from, from everyday life in England that she stitched together to speak about her disjunctive presence in in the world. And of course, Shuta Pabiswas, and if we think of Isaac Julian's territories, all of this with Eddie Chambers' massive work of cutting and pasting comments and commentaries on black art and finding a language and finding that representation, which I think you then, in your days at Inifer, summed up through Steve Udit's work. Steve Udit, who had come to study at Goldsmiths from Trinidad to do his MA, and you published his work, which was on Creolite in, in one of the early works, which formulated some position with, with regard to it. It's that journey that rather interests me. You know, Rashid, as I said yesterday, swinging from anger with Hegel right through to a rage against the Arts Council of Great Britain. <laughs> he swings between theoretical targets and very actual targets that were blockages to us moving forward to finding the object of knowledge to clarifying an epistemological ground. Eventually, I don't even use the word uh, epistemology, uh, but xeno-epistemics meaning an alien do-it-yourself kind of putting together uh, a, a package, a kit, and the equipment through which one would, um, would discuss this difference in which we find ourselves in the 80s and 90s. So for me, that's the tussle in language and the search for a language and through that language to clarify the object of knowledge that uh, we have. I'm, I'm sorry if I've gone on too much about that, but I think the last, perhaps the last question I want to hear your thoughts on because I sense it throughout the book. And I think on that front too, this book has much to say to our present condition in art studies or in art education. And that is that if art is a, if visual art is a form of knowledge production, what sort of knowledge does it produce? And why is this knowledge different or is it different from the knowledge produced by anthropology or sociology or history? It has to be different. I think, for it to have an autonomous ground of its own as a, as a practice. And, and yet increasingly we have seen um, the visual arts discussions and knowledge production of visual arts translated into the language of sociology or anthropology. And how is this to be safeguarded? How is the knowledge that comes from art, from an art practice, filtered through verbal language, still to count as a distinctive language with the, uh, a body of knowledge with the peculiarity of its own that cannot be reduced to the knowledge given to us by history, sociology, the humanities, or the social sciences? 
that's the claim that we're in a sense making for mm. the visual arts, that it is a form of knowledge production. How will that stand on its own feet? If it is not return to the past where art was seen purely in secondary terms as a decorative addition to uh, or illustration of the humanities or the social sciences. That's such a huge Jilene, question. Uh, Jelaine, Jelaine, just, just one second. Uh, I wanted to, this, uh, at this time, it's, it's about like 11 o'clock, uh, 11 or five, no, my time <laughs> anyway. So about an hour or more. I just wanted to encourage, not to interrupt yourself, to encourage people in the audience and, and the participant to ask questions. There are some one question coming in and I will get to it later, but uh, please go ahead, Jelaine. I'm just trying to alert people that they could ask questions through the chat or the question answer. Well, I mean, the, that's a huge question, Sarat, but one of the, one of the things um, I was asked and one of the, paper, the first uh, text in the book was a keynote talk I gave for the Arts and Humanities Research Council who are indeed thinking about how do they uh, incorporate uh, artistic research and knowledge into their framework and which led, as you have said, to PhDs and in, in artistic practice. And, um, you know, my sense is that the, the whole way in which the AH, AHRC then had thinks about knowledge and research was based on a kind of scientific progressive model where you have a sort of thesis or question and then you set up out to research it, find the answer and then present your answer. Whereas with artistic practice, you know, you might start with the question, you might not start with a question, you might start with a feeling or a sensation or a moment in time and you might end up with 30 questions and absolutely no answers. And I think that is uniquely what uh, contemporary artists say. It is, it's hard to pin down. It doesn't follow that linear progressive trajectory that somehow comes to a, 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 a comfortable conclusion necessarily. And I think this relates to the question actually that Stephen Foster has, is asking. Hello, Stephen, it's good you're here. Um, saying, during the last 25 years, do you think that Afro and Asian artists have become totally assimilated into the art world in Britain? Or is there still an element of otherness? And I think that, you know, there's been a huge expansion and broadening out. I remember at Innova, one of our board trustees saying to me, so exactly, Jelaine, what is your definition of art practice? You know, because we, included film, we included performance. Now that seems like a very retrograde kind of questions, but the art world is incredibly amoeba-like, able to absorb all different kinds of forms of practice and all kinds of forms of artists makers and of um, different content. But I think that the structures of art still want to do what you were talking about, Sarah, which is to pin things down to close it down, to know it, to place it within some kind of scientifically knowable, definable category. And that's done through the labels, through the, the exhibitions and ways in which artworks are presented. Um, and that in itself, I think, is an attempt to constrain and limit. Um, but that's about a kind of institutional operation on the artwork and the ideas. And I think um, artists continue to make works that seek to evade that. Um, but maybe you have an answer to Stephen's question, a different answer to Stephen's question <laughs> about assimilation and otherness. Do you see it, uh, Sarat? I, I can read it for you again, the question, or you've seen it? I can't see, no. Okay, it's, uh, it's uh, of course, uh, Stephen Foster, he's, who's asking during the last 25 years, do you think the art, sorry, do you think that Afro and Asian artists have become totally assimilated uh, 
into the art world in Britain or is there still an element of otherness? And if I may just reflect on something that we have started to discuss uh, yesterday, which is on the politic of, of solidarities then, because at that time, the designation blackness was more expansive than in the US, um, especially with the black British uh, uh, art movement. It included Asian, Filipinos, uh, you know, major artists that we know today were part of that. But then that designation kind of disappeared. Uh, from that kind of became more uh, focused on people of uh, Afro-Caribbean or African uh, descent. Mm. Uh, I wanted to, to think, I wanted to think in answering that question is about what, what does it mean today, that politic of, of solidarity then and now, and, and how is it really in, in, the, in light of the question by Stephen Foster? Well, 25 years, I think, um, I don't know if I'm right in saying that we have another generation altogether. And of course, many of our artists are also artists who have been born in Britain and shaped in Britain. So what assimilation means in that context, compared to those of us who arrived in, in, in Britain, what Naipaul called the enigma of arrival, those of us who had to enter a particular world and had to resist assimilation because at the time the demand for assimilation was that on the basis that you were a copycat uh, modern person, that you were a derivative, that you were, uh, as it were, second hand. And it's against that sort of value system that the distinction was drawn between assimilation and integration. And so at that time, the demand was really for integration on the basis of who we are, as we are, the color we are, and the way we speak in the world in which we found ourselves. And the resistance to assimilation then meant something quite different, I would say, from how the issues of assimilation are, are thrown uh, at us today. If, if we take a young artist today growing up somewhere in Britain, they are in many ways already assimilated to the experience of being products of England, of Scotland, Wales, wherever they are. They might have some differences. I don't think that kind of difference or otherness with regard to being in England is the same thing. We don't mean the same thing that we meant 25 years ago in speaking of otherness and other cultures. Otherness today functions as that capacity for the unknown, for non-knowledge, for not knowing, and that entry or the adventure of the unknown when that is taken away from art and artists and creativity, then of course we have that flat assimilation of the sort that was so feared and avoided 25 years ago. And of course it would be a great loss to the whole of the field if that capacity of being open to the unknown, of not knowing, who we are and where we're going with our creativity, unless that is kept open and we are not entirely defined as this, that and the other prior to the creative act, then I think we um, are in a difficult, in deep waters. So I think the question has to be seen in terms of what it meant then and what integration and assimilation means today and the parameters that are quite different, how we would have to argue what we mean by these terms are quite different. There is a question, if I may intervene here, by Prita Maya. Uh, there's also a comment by Gavin Yantis, but let me start with the question by uh, Prita Maya. Uh, she said, thank you for this fascinating discussion Artistic expression is often primarily framed through the lenses of individual or identity positions in contemporary art criticism. But isn't it there also some to be said for creating narratives from the vantage point of cultural history, 
or to put it in another way, do you perceive a tension between writing culture histories versus art histories? I don't see a tension. I think they're, they're uh, intimately intertwined. And in fact, history is, is also a theme and moments in history is also a theme that runs through the book in a way because, um, you know, the, the Brighton Photo Biennial, which I was commissioned to do by John Gill and Photo Works, um, you know, took place um, not that long after the American and British invasion of Iraq. And um, it struck me that there was a connection between the mid 1960s moment that James Baldwin and Richard Avedon were speaking to and, the mo and that moment in 2005 when the biennial took place, which was about a certain mythology of empire and an attempt to reconnect or reinvigorate an idea of empire to justify actions in the present. And that there were also questions about the relationship between representation and the sense of visual representation and questions of political representation. So I, I think these things in, interweave. And similarly, there's an essay in the book called We Are the Martians, which is about science fiction and particularly about artists uh, like Hamad Butt, another Goldsmiths graduate and student of Surat's, a very important figure, um, and people like Yinka Shonabar, who were being quite playful uh, with draw and David Huffman and others drawing on science fiction and science fiction motifs uh, to, to talk about the question of migration and racism and difference. Uh, but that seemed to connect back in the aftermath of 9-11 and what was in London known as 7-7, where there were bombings on the underground and buses, which, uh, you know, saw the Islamic other and, and as a threat and as a sort of visceral threat to British society and civilization. And it seemed, and there was a, a witch hunt almost, you know, around uh, anyone who um, articulated difference through an Islamic frame, Muslim frame. And, you know, it, it, that seemed to me to resonate with the McCarthy era and, and what took place in those in that moment and how science fiction, it was cultural forms, film in particular, that sought to problematize uh, those questions of difference and otherness. Um, so I see them very much as interweaved. Um, just to read for you, Gavin Yantis, and, and, and I encourage him also to raise questions and comments as he was a witness and a participant in that uh, period we're discussing. Um, he said, I don't have a copy of Ghislaine's book, I have to, but I have to trust my knowledge of her, of her competence to create stimulating publications as she did so successfully at Innova. I expect this book to be a sign post uh, pointing towards a zone of investigation that lies in the future, away from the past, opening a new visual research that is enriched by past struggles and daring to find a way of touching, reaching others uh, that does not rely fully on language uh, of the literal form. Just as I had to use Fanon, George Padmore, or Ngugi, Du Bois in the early 70s, this book will point to a new horizon. So, well, thank you, Gavin. You, if you hey, have no, questions, but uh, I, Sarat, do you have another question? Uh, or I just have a specific question while I'm encouraging other people to... Uh, uh, one, one comment that actually relates to some extent to what um, Gavin was saying is that some of the writings and some of your chapter really point to uh, the importance of, of research and, and in, in the past, but also uh, encouraging people in the future or students who are actually entering the field to do so. Um, 
I, I was intrigued by your chapter, Egypt at the Venice Biennial, 1967 uh, and uh, 1968, because uh, first of all, just reflecting on my own, or just remembering our own experience in Venice when you create, when you did the uh, Africa in Venice second project, um, there was always this talk, and after that, there was always this talk, oh, these are the first pavilion African <laughs> presence, you know. And people forget that Egypt has that from the 1940s. Uh, so a pavilion in Venice as an African. Of course, there are many reasons for not thinking of Egypt as African. It was explored in Black Asina and many texts. But I'm intrigued by the fact that uh, you, if you can just talk about that research that you compare how the record of the British pavilion is very well done, very well recorded, intact, while the British, British one, sorry, the Egyptian one is not as you know available as it is but digging into it which is what i'm saying about pointing to the future i wish somebody could take that as a dissertation or a book project to, to reflect on the history just of the egyptian mm -hmm. pavilion so if you can say a few words about that because for me just intrigued by the fact that people think that now suddenly they discovered uh, um, you know india flaton and it's, it's over the, all over the place People think about her, even the New York Times a few weeks ago, but it was, she was exhibited in 68. Yeah. And, and her series on, 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 on you know, the prison or the Don Shuai, and so it was actually very relevant to the politics of the time. And in one way or another, also a critique of the regime in Egypt itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that, you're right. There is a book to be written about about that and a very and it's important research that needs to be done but I was very yeah there were a couple of things that I was very interested in thinking about one was uh, this difference in what is considered important to be remembered archived remembered um, and and there was you know even the Venice Biennale archive couldn't tell me definitively whether there had been a a uh, presence or an exhibition in the Egyptian pavilion in Venice in 1968. It took them a while to even be able to confirm that or not. Um, but I was also interested in the fact that 68, you know, is seen from a European lens as sort of this moment of revolutionary upheaval and challenge to the status quo. And yet, you know, in Egypt and Palestine and other parts of the Middle East, you know, something has happened between these two, these two biennials of 66 and 68, which is absolutely, you know, shattering and decisive. Uh, not quite as decisive as the Nakba in 1948, but nonetheless a very important historical moment. And what I saw in the two biennials, you know, the Egyptian presence between those two was an extraordinary, you're right, a critique, um, a sense of the shattering of a sense of national self-determination and lack of confidence in, in, a, in national identity, which is sort of played out, a critique of the Nasserite regime and its aspirations and its oppressions. Um, but also relevant to this moment, you know, in GF Latoon is looking back at the colonial moment, at a colonial history of British occupation and its cruelty and its violence and uh, choosing, you know, a particular episode in that history. We don't have time to go into that now, which in to, to represent pictorially. And... But also what was interesting was in the commissioner of the pavilion's text, which again, I couldn't find a translation to. So, you know, in Sarat, Sarat's DIY concept, we find ourselves becoming, uh, you know, uh, incidental translators. Um, and the text is all about uh, an aspiration of the commissioner for greater understanding and connection between artists and intellectuals in the Middle East, the Arab world, and in Europe. And the 
the exhibition is offered up as a gesture, as a symbol of and, and, and call for solidarity and connection, uh, which I found incredibly moving. Well, there is a question uh, by Warren Krishlo. Uh, Sarat's comment on the epistemic object is intriguing with respect to new critical qualities of knowledge production, aesthetic and otherwise in black uh, British arts movement in the 1960s and, uh, sorry, in the 1970s and 80s. But I wonder what Jelaine and Sarat might comment on artists who predate what is considered to be the Renaissance period. I'm thinking of artists like Frank Bowling, whose work in abstraction and color in the late uh, 1950s and 60s not uh, only now achieving recognition. How does the work of Bowling and others of that earlier post-war uh, uh, post period bear upon or open up how the epistemic object of art has evolved in critical discussions of contemporary black art practices in Britain and indeed globally. Before I just end this, I would say the first person that brought Frank Bowling's work to my attention, it was in 2003, it was you, Jelaine, when you included him in the show in, in the Venice Biennial and gave his, the African maps, that whole big wall. So to you, both of you. I'll let Sarat go first this time. <laughs> sure. Well, I think, uh, yes, they, uh, people like Frank Bowling and Aubrey Williams and so on, uh, Anish Chandra, for a little while, even Frank D'Souza from India, uh, that generation, was, were treated unevenly as, as part of this notion of the derivative or other modernity. The German uh, art world eventually came up with the anderen modern, this notion of the other modernities and tried to categorize artists from elsewhere in a certain notion of otherness. Now the word other has had many uses over a period. It's not always a positive use. It has, there is a negative other and there is a positive other and there is an ambivalent other. And by the other modernities, it was meant generally a secondary modernity that followed the first. And I think Frank Bowling and so on were, were, were placed in that until things changed and of course, today we have deep appreciation of their work because of their commitment to the autonomy of a certain creative force. And that, that couldn't be entirely, first of all, put in language or pinned down through language in terms of identity. Of course, there is a great deal of writing around their work in terms of writing, I think, with um, uh, with, with Aubrey Williams's work, there was always the question, well, what the hell is he doing listening to Shostakovich and painting? That, that wasn't the kind of thing a non-white artist should be involved in. What kind of art should a non-white be doing? There was this long period of getting over this idea that that was not for you. When that is got over, then I suppose the framework changes to looking for some identity concept or concept centered around identity through which to interpret and understand the work. Whereas I think their work <clears throat> tends to escape the notion of identity entirely, not entirely, but in, in some important ways and is a lesson for where we are to some extent headed that is, that identity questions are very important in establishing the scene of representation, but there is a non-representational force that is involved in art and non-representation, not just in the lit literal sense of abstract art, but non-representational in the sense that there is no ready-made given theme with which one sets out to represent in one's art, but that, that has to come out of the practice itself. We don't know where that takes us. That is the element of non-knowledge in the work. And when 
Frank Bowling, for example, immerses his canvas in the Thames and looks at what collects and sticks to the canvas surface. This is a version of that dust breeding that Duchamp spoke of, art creating itself with a minimal human agency involved in it. And therefore, with all respect to all other forms of agency, natural forces, um, hydraulic forces, the forces of the stickiness of glue and so on on the canvas, that this somewhat what we would call chance accidental element is taken on board in the, in the creative act in order to produce something that can't simply be reduced to an illustration or representation of one's cultural identity. And I think that is the lesson we learn that identity is important up to a point, but art is a kind of activity that may help us, I don't want to use the word transcend identity, uh, because in the kind of cultures we live in, in, in the circuits of contemporary art, that, uh, which are largely based on materialist uh, philosophical uh, groundings, that kind of language suggests uh, a sublimity that is unattainable, that is simply another myth, but if we think of practices like tantric art of India, which come down from ancient times, but also have a contemporary presence that's absolutely vital, that has all to do with coming from the earth, the search is to transcend our identity. The search is to go beyond identity, beyond our gender identity too, not as man, not as woman, not as divine, not as human, not as natural, not as unnatural, and certainly not in terms of social and cultural and political identifications. So I think that's the lesson I learned from the neglect of the older generation and their return to attention, though that is also problematic as far as the institutions go, but the fact that they are on the table for our attention again is an extremely valuable lesson to learn in an age that is totally, as it were, anchored in the search for identity. Jelen? Um, well, I mean, I, I think that there is more, so much work to be done on Frank Bowling's work on FN Sousa. I think, um, it was hard, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s for younger generation completely to, to get their heads around. You know, they, they perhaps thought that this work was unpolitical, if not apolitical. And they uh, art were articulating a different kind of register and content, or at least it appeared so. And yet, if you look at Frank Bowling's work and paintings like Middle Passage, for example, which are extraordinary paintings that speak through abstraction and through the quality of the paint and the layering of the paint and the, the voids, you know, which he creates through his use of paint to the experience of you know, the, the barbarism of, of the slave trade um, and the Middle Passage, you know, it, it, it's that, there, that that has not been addressed in that way in his work. Similarly, you know, F.N. Sousa went through a period when he made black paintings only. He made a whole series of black paintings, figurative and landscape paintings, which everyone was appalled by because they wondered where his, you know, incredible, vibrant colour, abstract, you know, paintings had gone. And in, interestingly, these paintings are made at the very period in which, you know, of, of decolonization, of independence, insurrection, you know, across the globe. Um, so that there is a there is a criticality and a politics to the work 
which I mean to anticipate Gavin's question that he's asked, I think institutions are fearful of engaging with and they don't quite know how to locate Frank Burling and Ethan Sousa within an art historical trajectory of post-war modern modernity and the criticality in politics, which I believe is also in their work. Well, really, thank you so much. I mean, we went over the time, and but but it has been very engaging. It reminds me of that wonderful book that you published on the dialogue between Sarad Maharaj and and uh, and Stuart Hall on modernity and difference. And and I hope we can make something out of this discussion as we recorded it. It's really been very enlightening uh, uh, and, and, and very uh, inspiring and, and, and hope we can continue uh, to have these debates in the future. Uh, I thank you so much, Jelaine. Thank you so much, Sarad. I know both of you are very busy people and Sarad is, is specifically. Uh, uh, I'm very, very grateful for your intervention on this. Uh, Jelaine, thanks for this great book. Uh, and I will repeat the title again, The Sphinx Contemplating Napoleon, Global Perspective on Contemporary Art and Difference. It's published by Bloomsbury. So I encourage people to acquire it and to buy it. And we do have copies that are signed actually in the uh, Africa Institute for those who are uh, in the local uh, area. So thank you so much again. I hate to end it this, uh, at this moment, but I know lots of people stay throughout. And I'm very grateful to all the participant audience and attendees. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stella. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.